Welcome to The Culture Bar, a panel discussion podcast exploring, dissecting and shedding light on important topics in the arts and music world which matter to you. Hello, I'm Henry Southern and today on The Culture Bar and as part of our Under the Spotlight series, we will be discussing how the arts can respond to the climate emergency. And to explore this vital topic, we are delighted to be joined by three expert panellists. First up, Sam Lee. Mercury Prize nominated folk singer, conservationist, song collector, and award-winning promoter, broadcaster, and activist. Next, Alex Sobel, MP for Leeds Northwest and Shadow Minister for the Arts, Heritage and Tourism. And last but by no means least, Crispin Woodhead, Chief Executive of the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Welcome everyone. Hello, Henry. Henry. Nice to see you. Thank you. Wow. As a starting point and for a foundation for a discussion, I think it would be great for our listeners to know more about your experiences and the proactive measures you've all been taking to tackle the climate crisis head on. You all have very distinctive and unique approaches. And Sam, I'm going to come to you first, if that's okay. You are part of a movement called Music Declared Emergency. Can you tell us more about that, please? Indeed. Um, MDE, uh, we've uh, been running, operating for about two years now as a voluntary-led Um, uh, gathering of industry members um, who have come together over a unified um, inclination towards changing uh, from the inside the music industry making it uh, carbon zero by 2030 and tackling all the different points of impact where music as an artistic expression from the studio to the live to the travel to the audience movement in every aspect can be um, can be uh, changed and bringing about a movement both from the industry but also an encouragement of artists to engage with climate awareness the ecological crisis and um, we've achieved an incredible amount in fact two things that connect I think the the three panelists here is one of our probably smaller campaigns is about the the train rail card for musicians to try and uh, and uh, allow cheaper rail fares for musicians to disincentivize them from having to drive and also uh, in fly. And I know Crispin's been doing good work with that and the orchestra and Alex has been a great supporter of that campaign too. So um, we've yeah we are essentially trying to both both advocate for artists to really embrace what that means on their platforms within their within their social media uh, we're running a no music on a dead planet campaign at the moment which has uh, got hundreds of artists of enormous caliber um, wearing our t-shirts and putting our statement and set of uh, principles across fantastic thank you and i hope the rail card also extends to music management as well that would be lovely <laughs> <laughs> um Alex, I think I'm sure there's some synergies there. I'm aware you took the initiative and formed an all all parliamentary group, all party parliamentary group in 2019, aiming to reduce carbon emissions to net zero as quickly as possible. Um, it'd be great to know more about that, but also just to pick up on Sam's point about being carbon zero by 2030. I'm aware of these interim targets, and the main one is, I gather, is 2050. Bill Gates in his in his book recently was advocating to aim for 2050, not for interim targets to 2030. It'd be great to get your thoughts on on all of that. Yes, so we we set up the all party group on net zero um, because although we have an all party group on climate change and on energy use on a whole range of issues, there wasn't anything specifically about driving to that target. And when it was, we were still in the bidding process, but it was fairly clear that the UK would have a role in hosting COP, which it now does, is the main host of COP in Glasgow in November, that, that we need something to drive to that net zero we needed the next cop which should have been last november because the coronavirus is this november um to 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 have a binding net zero agreement and that's why we did it that because it's an all-party group and we have members of all parties we we don't have a date because the parties can't agree but from a personal point of view um i I still want us to to aim for net zero at 2030 so the 2050 date is is a general date it's the date the Biden administration are now looking at. It's the day the UK have legislated for. The EU are also aiming at that date or, or a, uh, if possible, an earlier date. Um, but I, I still think we need to drive it at 2030. And so, you know, the fact that, for instance, we're only going to be banning the sale of um, internal combustion vehicles around then isn't good enough because that means there'll be a lot on the road. So, so 
I, I'm, I've got a higher level of ambition, but, but, but it's good to hold the government's feet to the fire and global leaders' feet to the fire at COP. And, and if we get a, a net zero 2050, I won't say that that's terrible. I'll say that that isn't my level of ambition, but it is, um, it is forward movement and it does raise our ambition. That's what it should all be about, is about it raising ambition and not just about ambition. It, we need the practical steps behind it. So Sam mentioning the, the rail card, the work to reduce um, the emissions of, of touring musicians, um, is important. Obviously, at the moment, unfortunately, there are no tours and the UK government have made it particularly easy for musicians touring the EU. But when all of that is resolved, we need them to be travelling on, on trains and not planes. OK, thank you. I mean, there's there's lots to unpack there, which I'm sure we'll come to later. Um, and actually, it's a quite a nice segue to you here, Crispin, talking about all things trains, because I know you've undertaken a tour very recently all by train, is that correct? Yeah, I'll come to that in just a moment. I mean, the, the, the crucial thing here is that, you know, we've got, whether whether we, we're 20 years to one point or another, uh, we have a sense of direction uh, uh, and that we've all got to move in that direction. <clears throat> one of the things that interested me was um, that when you want to go somewhere, you normally know where you're starting, right? And uh, what I found quite surprising was how um, little... It, there seem to be in terms of awareness about where we actually were. Everyone has this nebulous idea that there is a big problem and they see some significant statistics about, uh, and not only statistics, but also they see evidence or, or relatable um, uh, alleged evidence of what's going on in terms of our activity. We can see the change in our climate. We can see what's happening at the camps. And, uh, and we see some pretty... Uh, um, disturbing figures that come out of various reports that tell us, you know, how that relates to our activity. But when, when you go down to a sort of individual business level, um, the, the operational awareness of what you're doing and what consequence that has is quite low. And it isn't mandatory for people to assess. And in fact, there was a government direction in 2018 that, gov that organisations ought to go through some kind of audit and understand what they're doing. And actually, this is not required and people don't do it. And so to produce a carbon budget, to be, able to, be, to be able to do something which is, you know, according to the sort of greenhouse gas protocol, you know, that sort of standard that can, can articulate in terms which are relevant and quantitative, accurate, complete, consistent, comparable and transparent. That is not a standard practice for any organisation in the UK. It just isn't. There are only a few that report that actually determine what their approach is going to be do they have a financial control approach in other words are they looking at their impact in terms of their balance sheet what scopes are they applying to the, to the emission and, you know have they actually analyzed it properly so we did this and we didn't know how to start we got advice from the wonderful professor uh, kathy lewis in oxford who's a leading biodiversity specialist who was very generous with her time she gave me the first piece of i mean i was babe in the woods she said You've got to stick to your balance sheet. And I thought, oh, that sounds a little bit punchy. But what do you mean I'm absolving others of, or myself of responsibility? And actually, it's a practical step. If you are accounting properly for what you do in terms of carbon or CO2e or environmental impact, with the same diligence that you have when you go to your auditors with pounds, shillings and pence, then it's very really clear what you're doing. And then it becomes even clearer what other people need to do to fit in so that you have an interlocking pattern of responsibility around corporate activity and that feeds into individuals and their behavior and so we started on that program and we went through and we hit against all sorts of stumbling blocks like if you go to promoters and you go to venues and you say how much energy do you consume do you convert into heating for example how much energy do you get through in a day for a day high they don't know they don't know they can't tell you very few can Cecil sharp house could actually so we created a unit. That sounds like an indictment to all the other venues. It's not their fault. It's just that no one told them that was coming up. So we created a unit called a Settle Sharp House, which is <laughs> it's the amount of energy you need for a venue in a day, like loo flushes, water, you know, the whole lot. And then we thought, well, that's about eight Cecil Sharp Houses. So you know what the impact is if you hire a much bigger venue, right? Well, that's the challenge. Organisations don't know. And then if you go to 
if you speak to colleagues, and I'm not, I was the same, you say, well, what is the difference between, they don't know the difference between rail and, and international rail, or long haul and short haul, or even, uh, is a hotel room the same or wrong? No, it isn't. It depends on the, t the, the, na the, <laughs> the local climate, and how much they use central heating and air conditioning, and the state of the building and everything else, and actually when you're transporting things around, different vehicles have different, entirely different consequences. And then you realise you're not just talking about CO2E, but you're talking about the five greenhouse gases and that includes incredible exotic things like like uh, i don't know uh, the sulfur hexafluorides and the perfluorocarbons these exotic animals they're part of it too so you just have no concept so we just have to start from basics and work it out and actually work at just how bad we were because until you know how shocking your behavior is you can't really articulate any kind of improvement they became obvious so there's an instant obvious determination you could have guessed this but it wasn't worked out Three quarters of our impact is air travel. That's it. It's a place to start, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And so therefore, you undertook a tour last February, all by train, 72 hours by train. I gathered to Poland and Hungary, yeah. uh, which we'll talk about more later. I think one of the things which uh, well, was quite a few things to unpack there, but um, I would say one of the debates for our industry is a belief, perhaps, in international cultural exchange versus our responsibility for the environment and how we balance those two things um and also the commercial and artistic aspirations that that go within that um sam how do you sort of uh become at ease with that with that balance well i mean crispin's raised some really uh, important points about the bluntness of the tools that we're using and the complexity of when you're dealing with you know the the, the chemical impact uh, and the ramifications of that be that just on plain greenhouse gases, plain greenhouse gases, carbon and methane, but then all the other nuances of the behaviour of packaging, materials, that sort of thing. And then also as an artist, you know, what's, uh, how does one, how does one embrace that? How does one communicate that? It's, it's an absolute minefield. It's different for every individual person and their, their practice as an artist, where they tour, um, whether they're you know, heavy freight or whether they're a light singer songwriter. Um, and also particularly in the sort of venues they're playing, um, there's a lot of benefit to people being in venues that are centrally heated, um, the, 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 the gathering of people. There's a lot of uh, counter arguments of why certain things are actually very good. The biggest output of a festival's uh, carbon emissions is the travel of the audience. It's about 89, 80 something percent. Um, so when we, you know, pin the artists, uh, obviously it's different for an orchestra, but when, when you put the implication on the individual, it has to come as a unified change and shift. But at the same time, the other big challenge for me that's more critical is, is that that needs to happen, but also an awareness of what why we're doing it and what the implications are, because I think this is the separation from from the actions on a, a very abstract um, impact that's happening at different rates in different parts of the world to different people, particularly the global south, obviously, is how do we communicate that sense of responsibility and accountability? Um, I'm very keen to look at biodiversity loss. I work specifically with looking at nature decline in the UK. I work specifically with looking at birds such as the nightingale and the turtle dove all set to go extinct through habitat loss. And, you know, there's, you know, there's complexities here. The HS2 scheme, which I'm intrinsically opposed to because of its devastation of habitat, is at the same time advocating a transport that I'm in support of. Um, yet uh, it's about what are we trying to hold on to? What are we what are we prepared to lose? Um, I think there's a wider issue of how we manage, steward our natural habitats, our you know our ecosystems and our local ones, and also um, re realign us as a nation with a, a sense of relationship to the natural world as a point of artistic inspiration as much as a, a place that's going to help keep us alive for a little bit longer. So there's these big meta and micro issues that we're all dealing with, which is very hard work for a musician who's generally just trying to work out what the next song they're going to write is going to be or where their next gig is going to come or how they're going to pay their rent. Well, certainly I think we'll talk later about the enormity of this challenge from an individual level and and versus that on a systemic level as um as well but 
Alex, I saw you nodding furiously about all things HS2. I mean, in your brief, you're a shadow minister of tourism. Surely you want to be encouraging UK arts organisations to be travelling and, and its, power, its soft power is vital. And in turn, also people coming to the UK to, to um, experience our wonderful arts institutions. I mean, that, that's absolutely right. And um, part of my sort of internal brief on this is to encourage the more domestic tourism, which, which, which doesn't hugely help um, here. But, but in, in essence, a lot of our festivals, you know, if we can, if we can attract people to come without the need for air travel and those festivals and events are still financially viable, then all the better. Um, and we've now got the, you know, we're using this technology that we're on today and we, and, th and that is a great leveler as well. We've seen lots of musical performances, which a lot of people wouldn't have been able to experience either free or much cheaper um, uh, online. And, and uh, the, although I, I, you know, I'm, I'll be honest, the sort of um, gigs I go to, I probably go to a little bit of the sort of things that Sam plays at, but not so much ones Crispin plays at. I'm more likely to be found in the mosh pit than in Glyndebourne. But, nice. you know, it was an experiential oh, level. Is that, oh, well, there you go. Maybe it's for me. Um, so um, the sort of an experiential level, you can't get that over Zoom. But um, we're in a sort of situation where um, the the the... The big, the big strategic and legislative um, indicators mean that it's much cheaper to fly than it is for rail travel. We need to reverse the subsidies and the, and the tax incentives so that the, the costs change. And, the, you know, because there's two factors here. One's cost and the other's time. So obviously, in terms of um, time, it's never going to be quicker to go by train than it is uh, to go uh, by plane. But there are ways of shortcutting some of that. Night trains is a good example. So that cuts down the need for high speed rail and utilising uh, rail capacity, off peak rail capacity, which isn't being used during the night means that we can we can travel much greater distances. Um, we just need to refit the trains and have the have the capacity available. And it, that also would really speak to to touring musicians because if you think about it, the two elements in touring is one. Are the buses that take the musicians that they sleep on the other one are the are the the trucks that take the equipment if you could refit trains one for night trains that, that had the capacity to take the musicians but also had freight freight cars or equivalent freight cars to take the equipment then you could refit and re-engineer the whole way that people tour but it's going to take one it's going to need pressure from sam and crisp in their whole industry um, and a broad arrangement to the film industry is another one again that could utilize the same sort of technology and other creatives um, um, art exhibitions etc um, but also it's going to it's going to need um, that government action and for us to push as well and it's going to need um, um, us to work across Europe on this so realistically it does need government change in order to enforce individual change be it from audiences, but also touring ensembles or individuals as well? I'd say it slightly differently. It needs the okay. government to facilitate the change, right? So at the moment, with the best will in the world, if you've got a tour manager with a tight budget based on ticket sales and um, the, the, what tips the tour from being in profit to being loss is moving transport from aviation to rail, then they're not going to do it because they're not going to run a loss-making tour. Um, but if the government then flip that and make rail cheaper than air, then actually the tour manager might default to the rail because it, it, flips, the, it flips the tour into profit from loss. And, then, and so you get both the benefits. But unfortunately, our legislation, our systems aren't designed for that. So the really stark example at the moment is, um, although they're crying about it in the aviation industry, they have been given a package to help them through COVID again in the budget yesterday. But where was Eurostar's support? Eurostar have had zero support from the British government. If Eurostar goes, then everything I said collapses because that is the gateway to Europe for the UK. There is no other real gateway. You know, ferries aren't going to work with rail. Only Eurostar's going to work with rail. Blimey, yeah, that puts it into stark contrast. Um, Crispin, you have some direct experience about all things green touring yeah, it'd be great to, to hear more about that Mike Sobel for president, <laughs> president please uh, now um uh, it's really 
startling to hear somebody who's not in our sector who, who is in politics um, rattle off pitch perfect the issues that make life difficult I mean you know if you take the Eurostar and it has to be protected it is just unconscionable to allow that I mean what is the point? The lives were lost digging, not many, but some people died digging that bloody tunnel. What is the point of allowing the main transit network that, that connects Great Britain with the European continent? What is the point of allowing that to fall into disrepair and, and disuse? It's just absolutely criminal. Um, and in a way, it, it shouldn't even be a matter of finance. It should be a matter of absolute solemn social responsibility that that system is maintained. And also that there is proper freight uh, for people who are travelling with equipment. Not just, of course, I'm thinking of double bases, but I'm completely sympathetic to those who have to lug camera gear or PA equipment or whatever it is that they need for their for their work. It just sort of be straightforward and also temperature controlled and dry so that when it turns up at the other end, it doesn't completely blow a fuse as soon as you plug it in or need a week to dry out. I mean, this is really important stuff and it's not difficult to put in place and it could be sustainable and you're absolutely right. Um, there's a, I'm going to talk about the train thing in a minute, I promise. But this crucial issue of, you know, uh, facilitating um, local local individual decision making that's really important. I'm still very much of the mind that big change, the the movement in the centre of the people who sort of bumble around looking for their slippers, who who actually hold the balance of of the environment in their activity, um, they need they need direction from from boards and from governments who f who feel the pinch of accountability if they take decisions which don't look right and feel right, which is why I'm a sort of big fan of client earth, uh, making people, making making organisations think, actually, we just can't afford to foul out the planet because it's bad for business and we'll get kicked off the board. Anyhow, um, so I'm, I'm delighted to hear a politician who gets it. It's fantastic. Um, and, and someone who understands it in a way which is not signa singularizing one art form rather than another. It's not orchestras and their special bijou needs. It's everybody who needs to uh, get on tour and be part of the soft power cultural exchange who doesn't, by the way, when they're doing it, want to ruin the environment in the programme. Um, just briefly about our train trip, to make the point, we, we you know, you wouldn't normally uh, take the, take, a train to go to Budapest or to Setsin in Poland to give a concert and the reason you wouldn't normally do it is because uh, it's very very easy to go to the airport and get on a flight and two hours later you arrive if you get the train you have to get about seven of them and you, you spend a day and so the 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 change it's like it's an incredible um, increase in the number of hours it's a 14 hour trip um, each way to go to Setsin in Poland by train and it's two and a half hours on the plane um, but when you unpack that and you look at what you're doing to the environment, if you fly for 20 people, it's about 3.4 thousand um, kilograms of CO2E that you're spaffing into the environment. If you take the train, it's 240. Can I just add to that? I will ask a question. You know, aviation only contributes 2.5% of carbon emissions. So yeah, it's it... three quarters of what we do. And the point is, <laughs> if you say, yeah, fine, but that's like, that's just getting off the hook, isn't it? It's like, no, yeah, no officer. I think you're fine. I was only doing 35 and most of the serious accidents happen. Uh, you know, da, 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 da. So you really should, no, I don't understand that sort of moral calculus. Everybody has to do their bit. Everybody has to contribute to progress. And if we think in absolute terms or what aboutism, we'll just run aground. It, 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 those, are, those are absolutely the havens of people who would rather not do anything. And the thing is when, I can imagine people listening to them thinking, oh, bloody trains, oh, trains, it's a, it, actually it was fun. It was fun to go by train to Chetzin. It was fun to go by train to Budapest. It was a bit more expensive, but actually it was fun. And if you've got hmm, 20 very talented people on a train together for three days or four days, could you do something of financial benefit to, to themselves and of value to the world in that time? Yes or no? So it's just a test of imagination. So you've got like this captive workforce. They had a great time and it was wonderful. And if you've not arrived by a train in Budapest Grand Central Station, you've not lived. And um, people, the other thing is that people don't realise um, what the country looks like 
as you travel from France to Poland. They've got no sense of it. They've got no idea. Um, so it's a good thing from, if you talk about soft power and understanding the world, it's a brilliant thing. And then you have a bit more of a sense of what the environment is and how it changes and how different things grow in different places. And you, you sort of get, it's like a lesson in biodiversity just by looking out the window. Um, but the fundamental thing is that the, the impact difference on the environment is just unconscionable. And so, you know, I sound like someone who's about to start sort of, you know, shouting through letterboxes at people that that take short haul flights. I'm not. Uh, and I think that it, it's just about making progress. And my advert to people was, actually, it was fantastic fun. It was a bit more expensive, but, you know, you could spend your money on worse things. And it was a far less stressful experience. If you go through an airport on a short haul flight at five o'clock in the morning to do a concert the same day, you are taking weeks off the lives of those artists, really, what you're putting them through. The duress that people undergo. I've seen older players, you know, sitting on their briefcases at Heathrow Airport, catching their breath because they're done in. It's no way to live. Well, I think these uh, measures you put in place for, for greener touring is certainly very admirable. And I know you've also um, been working with the Woodland Trust, looking at reforestation and offsetting. But do, and this is a question for for all of you: Do all these measures? Okay, as I say, extremely admirable measures, do they go far enough? Because, I mean, Alex, you mentioned about this earlier about audiences. At what point do you, can you legitimately say everything is carbon neutral with this engagement? I'll open it up. Sam, do you want to? Yeah, I'll respond. I mean, it, this is, a, this is as you say, is an aspect of the impact that we are doing. I, I want to draw attention to the wonderful organisation, Judith Bicycle, um, and their work uh, over the last 15 years of looking at the, the kind of wider implications of touring and their Green Riders scheme, which is uh, a brilliant downloadable pack about how artists can uh, minimise at all points their, their carbon output. Um, one of the big ones that is not talked about enough is actually the diet of the musician while on tour. And one of the things that I've made sure that my band uh, are adhering to everywhere we go, that our that we ask of all venues that all our food is vegetarian. If you start looking at what the um, the, the carbon cost of, of beef, pork, chicken, and also the habitat loss for, for the feed for those creatures to be eaten is so utterly devastating at, at every end that actually um, the impact of just choosing while one is touring to have a, a, a relatively healthier and vegetarian diet is really important. Um, that's, that's one that um, a lot of uh, Fest, not a lot, I wish, wish it was a lot. Some festivals are starting to really advocate that they minimise the amount of meat that is on sale relative to the World Health Organization's recommendation of how much meat should be eaten per week and having that amount available as opposed to the enormous amount of meat that's brought into festivals. Uh, festivals like Shambhala, which is a, a world leader in sustainability um, and it is, is a practically carbon neutral now as, as a 30,000 person festival. Uh, has for the last three years been vegetarian and uh, 2019 went dairy free. Um, the other really vital part of where musicians and the music industry can make a huge impact and a, and a, a dent is in, in the wallet of the real offenders. And uh, Music Declares is working on a campaign with uh, Switch It and Move Your Money uh, encouraging musicians and organisations, record labels, institu arts institutions to stop banking with the real climate offenders such as Barclays, HSBC, that are uh, directly investing the money that is banked with them into fossil fuel companies. That's somewhere where you can really make, even at a small level, a massive difference about looking at where the, the economics of your, of your artistic practice are going, where you're spending, who you're paying to do the work. If there's more and more artists that are calling to, uh, to work with uh, packaging that is um, uh, sustainably sourced, is not using enormous amounts of plastic, then the cost of those, what was generally more expensive, my record label cooking vinyl, uh, charged me more back in the day to have the more sustainable packaging because of the nature of, of you know, the mass production. There wasn't simply the demand for it. But it's, if as a community we start to call upon things like rail travel, we have 
we have weight as and can actually start to down drive the prices down of where things have generally been more expensive for their ecological benefit. And there's an enormous amount of research going on at the moment to just adjust but uh, all aspects and it's really exciting times but it needs to happen as a unified you know crisp in the work you're doing is not in silo but we we need a, a, a wider unified voice demanding these changes and being able to call on mass for uh, the ability to be able to practice at, at the moment you know the music is so hard hit and artists are, are struggling so much that we, ha we, we can't often afford to take the more expensive choices. And that's a real tragedy. We're having to make a more ecologically impactful decision if we're to do things at all. Um, don't even start me on the impacts of Brexit and what that's going to mean in terms of European travel. <laughs> show. You're absolutely right. Um, it's interesting what you're saying about how individual choices can also collectively have a bigger change. And, and Alex, picking up what we were saying earlier about saying, governments and policy facilitating that individual change. But just, just going back to the, the idea of greener touring, all these measures being well and good, but does it go far enough? I mean, it sounds like with your parliamentary group and you personally are holding government to account, you're extremely ambitious with the targets. What, what more, if anything, can we be doing at this stage? I think that there's a conceptual thing here, and I think Sam just touched on it. If we think about everything that we do, having a cost in carbon, not a cost in pounds or dollars or euros. Um, and the, the heavier the carbon cost or the greenhouse gas cost, the more expensive it is. And the government or governments can effectively um, balance the issues out because what they can do is they can say, this is heavier on carbon Therefore, we're going to tax it heavily. You can replace a whole load of taxes just with just a single carbon tax. And then Sam's issue around the packaging would go because um, Cooking Vine will be like, well, actually, it's cheaper to produce the bamboo packaging than it is the plastic packaging because the, the bam the, 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 there's a 120% um, you know, sales tax on plastic and 0% sales tax on bamboo. And people who say this is you know, fantastic or it doesn't work, the, the real world practical example of this is in Norway, where they completely changed how they taxed vehicles, personal vehicles. So petrol and diesel vehicles, um, the taxes went, went, went through the roof and electric vehicles effectively are zero rated on tax and, and included an element of subsidy. Um, so now, or in 2019, sorry, 55% of sales in Norway of personal vehicles were electric. That was just down to the actions of the government. That wasn't really driven by consumers. The government also obviously put the infrastructure in place. So consumers were like, which, which car's cheaper? The electric car's cheaper, I'm buying the electric car. And that is how we can drive consumer behavior. You just, you just need to weigh in, in pounds the amount of carbon each option has and make the lowest carbon option the cheapest by utilizing the tax system. Um, and, and so for flights, I wrote an article in, in the Independent in September 2019, so I'm not a recent convert to this, around a frequent flyer tax. And so this also answers the question around equity, around, you know, working class families wanting to go on holiday, you know, once every two or three or five years, um, that, that you have a frequent flyer tax where your first flight in a period, three year, five year period, has, is, is untaxed then your second flight is taxed more or less at the level it is now. Then your third flight is effectively, you double or triple each time the flight. So if you, for musicians, if you go on tour, that quickly makes the um, tour unviable if you're flying from destination to destination around Europe or, or, or globally. Um, but if you, if you plan your tour around rail or buses and, and um, lorries, um, particularly if they're electric um, or hydrogen, um, then then obviously it will reduce the cost of the tour. And the government, no government has yet taken up the frequent flyer tax idea, but it does need global action. Because if one country, because obviously it's transnational activity flying in most cases, most flights aren't domestic, they're international. Um, but again, the COP's a huge opportunity for this. And the only thing I'd say is there's an opportunity for artists and musicians and people with a voice, either because 
they have fame or because they have um, locus um, to come to Glasgow in November and make that voice heard. And so I'd invite Crispin and Sam and all of their colleagues to come with me and the politicians to go to Glasgow to make that voice heard. Yeah. Can I jump in and ask Alex a question? Because it's um, uh, the 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 response, the, the reasoning behind uh, the the failure of the government to uh, create a free movement of artists over to Europe uh, post Brexit um, has uh, the the what I've been hearing is that it's because they are so cautious about creating an exception for the arts industry that that then opening the door for all other industries, and I wonder how that works with. Um, you know, with why should why should the arts get privileged treatment? This is a contentious question coming from why should the arts get privileged treatment in you know in in uh, lower taxes on flights and 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 other industries which are also keeping the economy going and bringing pleasure to people's lives, not have that same uh, privilege, if that makes sense. It it does. I mean, on the first on the first part, I'm going to address that because I think people are really interested in that, and it's like you know, I was listening. To, on um, on the radio today to Radio X and there was they were talking to Wolf Alice and they had a discussion about that and that's commercial radio that's not you know Radio Six or BBC or anything so um, so um, I was I was on the phone when this was going through Parliament having a debate um, talking to Stuart Murdoch and Bell and Sebastian about this and the and the the issue is is that the, is is that it's it's multifaceted so it's not it's not solely around um, around the, the the work permit issue there's the cabotage issue as well there's the issue of um hiring and, and purchase or well, more hiring of equipment um um there's 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 a whole and 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 what it's what ha has happened is is that that um because it touches all of these areas i think it became too complex in negotiations for the government if it was just one area then the government probably could have sold it because they would make an exception in one area, but because there's all these different overlapping areas, I think that's what that that complexity made that complexity. But then moving on to the environmental sort of and that as an analogy to the environment, I don't think I was suggesting that the arts would get an exception. So when there's a frequent flyer tax, I'm not saying that, that that if you're going on tour, you'd be exempted from the tax. I would say that you would pay the tax, and that would shift the behaviour of tour managers. But also, it would create demand. You know, it create demands in the system. If rail companies um, and and others, you know, um, manufactured of hydrogen buses, which we have two in the UK, but they can't sell any of the buses anywhere, you know, um, create the demand, then it would the, then then these things would happen. And and um, you said right at the beginning that that music and arts in general in this country have a huge soft power globally, huge soft power. You think about the the biggest selling artists globally, you know your Ed Sheerans and your Adels and people like that. You know, you think generationally, back generationally, starting you know with the Beatles, the UK has had a huge soft power in this area globally. Now, what we're saying is we're going to dump that soft power. I don't think so. I mean, that's more related to the Brexit and the environmental question. But but um, that that we need we need to understand that that arts and culture in this country is replacing the things that we used to have and our influence globally which was the whole aim of brexit was that we're enhancing our our influence globally our ability to trade and all of those things that actually we are taking a backward step and so i think that that both on the environmental front and on the brexit front the government needs to re um re refocus and recalculate the effects because in two years um it's going to see, you know, we're going to have a whole generation of musicians coming through. You're established, Sam. You'd probably be all right. But if somebody, you know, you and if this was 2000 or 2005, you might not have a career now. You might be working an office job because of what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, before I move on, do you want to pick up from that? I think there's possibly potential to look at, because uh, I wouldn't want, um, I wouldn't want the... Uh, any kind of preferential treatment of the arts to then be counterproductive either to uh, political progress or indeed to the uh, the welfare of uh, people who work in culture. I, my feeling is that the sort of guidelines maybe if we're, one way to look at this is to look at not-for-profit and look at uh, cultural activity including sport as a group because I think that's much easier for people to understand 
uh, if these people are not making a profit, they're not allowed to make profit. They work as charitable entities and they're working in a sector which relates to everybody. Then I think it's much easier to see that as a group. And I think it's much easier then to relate that to the sort of um, cultural, um, if you like, national relevance that we have. Um, all great states look after the people who do those things. And I don't think that there's a good argument for stopping to do that now just because of uh, changes that are taking place either politically or environmentally around us as a result of actions that we may have taken in the past. So, I, I mean, I think that's probably a starter, but I, I can see why, for example, on Brexit, I can see why this fell off the table because um, if, if you were negotiating Brexit, you would probably start somewhere else and get into jib jam there first and then your time would run out and you'd be all the we've seen it we know the story you can understand why so many important things have been neglected of which this is one yes absolutely well as we near towards the end i'm going to endeavor to try and see if we can finish on some semi-positive notes um or you might disagree but i it's been said that the pandemic is a dress rehearsal for the climate emergency and so with that in mind, do you sense, say, Alex, on a governmental level, um, or, with, or Crispin with industry bodies, Sam with your, with your peers and, and other organisations you're involved with, do you sense that the tide is turning? I hope the answer is yes, hence why I'm asking for a positive note, but um, go for it. Tell me, what, what's, what's it like on the front line at the moment? You want me to start first? I mean, I think that, that, that um, one of the lessons of the pandemic is how quickly human behaviour can change. So we, we saw, you know, if you said two years ago, you'll be able to, to effectively lock down everybody in the country for, for, for months, people would have said, no, it's not possible. People just won't wear it. But basically that's been achieved. Now, the thing is, is that there isn't, the, the problem with the climate emergency, it's, a, it's, a, it's, like, it's like a, it's a slow motion pandemic. It's going to take a long, long time and, you know, sort of descending into it. And so the urgency isn't there. So you need to create the urgency. Um, I don't think the government's doing that. I think that we all have responsibility to try and create that urgency. And I, th I feel that, that I'm doing that. I certainly feel that Crisp and Sam doing that after meeting them today, but we all need to do to create that urgency to, to get those, to get that, that mentality across and then for the government to respond to it in kind. And I think that's where we are. But I, my view is things can change very quickly. And the biggest event that's happened recently that gives me hope is the the win in in america of, of joe biden and that complete transformation of views on the climate the appointment of john kerry as the as the envoy you know um i i had a meeting with john kerry last week not not like this there was a few more of us i don't i don't i'm not like, quite operating on that level where i've like small meetings with john kerry but um um and you know john kerry said you know th this you know that the cop is our last best chance to avoid catastrophic climate change Nobody in the Trump administration would have got anywhere within a million miles of that. I don't think our government is, is quite there. They're in like the league below. You know, if John Kerry's in the Premier League, then, you know, our government's in the championship, using the sports analogy. And we need to get into the Premier League, particularly as COP president. So I, I think that one, things can change very quickly. And two, I think that there's um, room for optimism, but, but that urgency is really needed. Crispin, do you want to go next? Um, one of the problems, yes, it, I, I think it's true. It's a dress rehearsal. I completely agree with what Alex said that, um, you know, it's remarkable how people can change in their behavior. I keep thinking of smoking and how attitudes to smoking have changed completely. I mean, I know there's a lot of vaping and, you know, that it's that, sort of sideways, there's been a sideways move, but you know, you, in that you see sort of imagination and technology and industry taking a taking up the baton and I think Alex you were pointing to that weren't you saying that if you if you drive taxes what you'll do is you'll stimulate another area of the economy which will take up the slack and give people the advantage that they've lost in the one that you want to defavorize so I think that 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 all makes sense to me that we can change behavior if we're looking specifically at at, at, at COVID you know it is you know it's good to look at the positives that have come out of it uh, but let's not ignore the mountain of absolute manure that it dropped on everybody. And, um, you know, I'm not going to be some poor bleeding heart about the arts because I don't think the arts are, are served by people whinging. Uh, actually, I think we just have to get on and work and be positive and serve. Um, uh, and I don't think you should be in the arts unless you're interested in service. But um, 
nonetheless, for anyone in that in, in operating that sector um, or a similar one, and you know there are many, and they don't have to be charitable. The COVID has been devastating, and it has had a massively retardant effect on the ability to make progress. Because I think Sam was saying earlier that you know one of the really significant issues is that you're looking at organisations with reduced balance sheets with extremely troubled. Uh, profit and loss, not just for this year, but for five years. Uh, Organisations which have never um, had particularly competent or strong reserves, which have been decimated. And then, you know, how are they going to be able to invest in the sorts of changes that are needed? So they're going to have to take, choose between, do I die now as an organisation or do, do my children die tomorrow because of what I'm doing? Oh. And it's it's an impossible dilemma. And uh, people tend to respond to the things that are under their nose rather than um, just beyond the garden fence. And so I think, that it, you know, what we've been through uh, indicates the scale of the challenge because it's all about the money and it's all about confidence with money. And it's a brave soul who goes in front of a, uh, um, a board that has its, its standard expectations of fiduciary responsibility and then says, I think we should be spending more at the moment when all they can see is a downward line. Not many people pull that off um, and not many boards acting as they should within charitable law with auditors at their heels will allow that. It sounds like you have pulled it off or are pulling it off. Well, I have a very enlightened board uh, and they are extremely supportive, but they're not stupid and they know the cost of these things. And and, and I think, you know, we do need to signal... Uh, I think there's a counterintuitive thing. Last thing I'll say on this, I think there's a counterintuitive thing we need to try and achieve here. I completely agree. I think that, that the people who are leading, the people who are setting um, setting schedules, setting frameworks at a government or a, a, a supranational level, I think they need to be uncompromising, demanding. But I think there needs to be this other thing that's going on, which is appealing to the bumblers, to the people in the middle, to the people who look no further than the end of their nose, that makes the right decision. Yeah, that's me too. That makes the right decision easy and accessible and not and not frighten them into doing it. Because if you if you say you must do all of these things, X, Y and Z, and if not, you're a failure and you're a traitor and you've done all that, then I think you're likely to get slower progress out of it. Um, you know, which, which is why I also think we need to be very careful about, even though it might be a great statement, I'm very nervous about making statements like carbon zero or carbon neutral about even the OAE. I, I think that's dangerous. And I think that people could get into a bad habit of thinking they write a check to the Woodland Trust, which is a great organization, and suddenly they're off the hook, like the system of Catholic indulgences. I think everybody needs to get wise to what they're doing and be part of a consistent program like the shift of culture around smoking, for example. Um, and the, the improvement in, in trends towards equality and dignity in the workplace, that you just keep bringing everybody in with rational, inclusive arguments until they're just doing the right thing with a shove from the top. Here, here. Sam, I'm sure you'll share some of those feelings as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and maybe the, what I can add here is a, a sense of long-termism and, and, and darkness and lightness, just you know, in response to the, the initial question. Um, Certainly the pandemic has been a preparation for what grief means and actually how we experience grief on a community, national, international level and, a, and the interconnectedness, um, which is something I think societies have lost a sense of in recent times. So I think that that sense of accountability to the impact of our actions has been sharpened. Um, I think it's really highlighted that ability to adapt as was being said earlier um and uh and i th but the thing that gives me hope in all of this is that um the change needs to come fast you know we are we are set for catastrophe one way or another you know climate change ecosystem collapse is happening already around us it's not going to be a, a pretty next 50 100 years we're going to see a decline it's just a matter of where it happens first and who it happens to first so i think that sense of building resilience and how we strengthen as communities to support each other and allow those changes to happen in a way that we are emotionally supported and community and support in the ways that actually are essential to us as human beings. The things that give me hope are the youth, seeing movements like Fridays for Future 
is is inspirational in seeing the, the rising up of young people and how woke they are to the issues and the importance of addressing it and their outspokenness and that sense of activism that is there within people who, when I was their age, would never have dreamt of going out and taking over Trafalgar Square and places like that. And I'm deeply grateful for those movements and other movements that have had a great impact, such as Extinction Rebellion, whether you like them or not, for the sort of change that they have initiated and the openness to talk about these things. But the arts plays such a pivotal role. And I think, you know, what we're all talking about here and how we can do what we do a little bit better. Ultimately, I've lived by the, the mantra that to beat the opposition, you throw a better party. And that the arts is, a, is ultimately the the most powerful weapon in bringing about social change music at its heart has been uh, has has been at the heart of protest particularly folk music maybe less so these days but ultimately all the big social movements in the last 60 years have had music and soundtracks as their anthem and the glue and the most the motivation the momentum and if we can if we can turn those powerful machines and those artists and those platforms into the direction of normalizing the changes that need to happen and the shift that people need to make and the sacrifices that people need to bring into their lives supported by government then i think the arts is going to be uh is going to be one of the most you know yeah one of the most powerful influences as the other saying i love which is that culture eats strategy for breakfast and uh we just need to make sure that arts can survive, can proliferate, be back to the, the same capacity it was, one, uh, you know, a year ago, better still, and that we are, we're supporting artists in really, um, you know, helping to paint a better future for everyone. Wow, yeah. what a fantastic sentiment to finish on. Let's all throw a better party. <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> if you can do that, apparently, do you want to do you want to throw some tunes at that party? Yeah, I, yeah, I, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow, throw a better party! What a great sentiment to finish on, and many thanks again for joining us, Sam, Alex, and Crispin. Thank you also to Fiona Livingston and our sound editor, Merlin Thomas. Our theme music is composed by Robert Cochran. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. If you haven't done so already, be sure to check out all the other episodes from The Culture Bar with topics ranging from celebrating women in music to LGBTQ plus awareness and representation in the arts. We've had guests from the BBC to the British Museum, from former professional football referees to other members of the UK Parliament. And to get all that and more, please subscribe. See you next time. <laughs>